Welcome to Author Stories, the podcast where we talk to the best writers in the industry and discuss writing and the creative process. Whether you're a writer, a reader, or both, we hope you'll find something here that makes you love books and the writers that create them. You can find archives of all of the great conversations I've had with authors over the years at hankgarner.com. Take some time and browse around there. I'm sure you'll find a new author to love, find inspiration for your own creative life, and find a new story to get lost in. Today, we've got a great show for you with Helly Kennedy. She is one of the writers on the new Serial Box edition of the continuation of Orphan Black. Before we talk to Helly, I'd like to thank some sponsors for making the show possible. Be sure to use the Amazon links in the show notes to show support for Michael to buy his books, and uh, we also earn a small, small commission from that as well. Edge of Valor, a military sci-fi thriller by Josh Hayes. When their mission fails, his begins. David Weber calls it a tour de force. Special Agent Jackson Fisher is a man after truth. When a military operation to extract a high-ranking ambassador from the war-torn border world of Stonemeyer ends in disaster, Fisher is called in to investigate. A whole platoon went in, but only three Alliance Marines returned home. The rest killed in action along with hundreds of civilians. With tensions between the Holloman Alliance and Stonemeyer rising, Fisher attempts to stitch the pieces together. One thing becomes more and more certain. The surviving Marines are lying. As the truth unfurls, Fisher begins to realize this was far more than a simple rescue mission and that the truth might be something best left buried. Filled with action, mystery, and well-crafted characters, Edge of Valor, the Valor series book one, will put you into a world of war, conspiracy, and betrayal. It's perfect for fans of David Weber's Honorverse or Tom Clancy's Jack Ryan with a futuristic flair. That's Edge of Valor by Josh Hayes. Chronicle of the Five by Garrett Godrick. From book one, a peculiar boy with a remarkable ability, a secret society on a dark crusade, an extraordinary device that could change the world. 14-year-old Cody Calder is a frightened, insecure boy who wants nothing more than to find courage and self-worth, and he has a difficult decision to make. He can go with his family and confront his fears or stay behind and hide at his uncle's farm. If he stays, he must say goodbye to the two most important people in his life. If he goes, his decision could change him forever. Cody's choice lands him in a faraway place where he finds himself on an unexpected path filled with mind-bending twists of fate and decision. And Cody's quest for self-discovery becomes a nightmare as he struggles to survive in an extraordinary new world, one he never knew existed. Book 1, Dark Revenant, and Book 2, Dark Legacy are available now with Book 3 coming soon. Chronicle of the Five by Garrett Godrick. R.J. Pinero in his brand new book, Chilling Effect, a global climate thriller. A ruthless eco-terrorist, a woman determined to stop him. Chilling Effect, R.J. Pinero's newest thriller, explores a world in the not-too-distant future where terrorism is taken to a new level one with world-ending consequences. You never know what you're capable of until the monster inside of you pushes you beyond your moral line in the sand. These are the opening thoughts of former climatologist William Christed as he prepares to attack our delicate ecosystem. He's hell-bent on avenging his father's death and will go to extremes of terrorism never before seen, all to strike a blow to those whose hubris led to his father's demise. He will take full advantage of the greed and narcissism ever present in the world, as well as the fragility of our planet to ecological terrorism, and use it to plot a scenario so grim, yet so compellingly real, it could have ripped from today's headlines. Check out the brand new thriller Chilling Effect from R.J. Pinero. Michael Anderley has a brand new series that's launching. It's called Opus X, and the first book is Obsidian Detective two rebels whose worlds collide on a planetary level. On the fringes of human space, a murder will light a fuse and send two different people colliding together. She lives on Earth, where peace among the population is a given. He is on the fringe of society, where authority is how much power you wield. She's from the powerful, the elite, he's with the military. Both want the truth, but is revealing the truth good for society? Check out Obsidian Detective, the very first book that's up for pre-order now from the new series Opus X by Michael Anderley. 
If you love comics the way I do, go check out Cool Comics in My Collection at edgosney.com. Ed runs one of the best comics blogs on the internet. New episodes each Thursday come out, digging into the things that we have loved about comics and comic collecting. There's something there for everyone. Go check out Cool Comics in My Collection at edgosney.com. Well, thanks for joining me again for the Author Stories Podcast, where I bring you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Today, I'm super excited to have Helly Kennedy on the show with me today. Uh, She has a brand new project with Serial Box. It's Orphan Black, the next chapter. And, uh, you know, if you're uh, a big fan of of audio uh, books like I am, this is a really unique um, uh, product that's out now that I think you guys are really going to love. Welcome to the show, Helly. Hi, thanks so much for having me on. Well, thanks for joining me. Uh, We begin each show with the same question, and that question is, what is your first memory of wanting to be a writer or storyteller? Oh, okay. Um, I was six years old, and I was in first grade, and I remember seeing a kid in second grade, so much older than I was, wow, writing (laughs) a full piece of foolscap paper worth of story. And it just looked crazy to me. It was insurmountable. I thought, I'm never going to be able to write an entire page of story. How am I going to do this? Um, and I remember talking to my teacher about it. And it kind of stressed me out because I realized I really, really wanted to write a full story like that on one piece of paper. Um, so I pushed myself through grade the first grade when I was six years old to keep um, to, to learn how to improve my writing skills and how to actually put together a story that had an arc. I remember thinking I've got to have, you know, beginning, middle and end. And uh, I worked my way up from maybe like three sentences to a full page. And then by second grade, I was writing picture books for my class and reading to them. Uh, And I had my friends illustrating. We had like a tiny little, I thought it was a publishing house at the time, honestly. And um, I know it was really, it was really extreme. And we published like, I think, five or six books during the school year uh, and read them to, to people in the school. So that's kind of my very early memory of, of wanting to write. You know, that's, that's pretty heady stuff for, uh, for a first grader and, and understanding your story structure. And I, I need a beginning, a middle and an end is, uh, you know, there, there are lots of writers in their thirties and forties that, that struggle with nailing those things down. It's not like I've necessarily always nailed it down. (laughs) Um, I just know about it, you know. (laughs) I have good intentions, but, you know, sometimes when you set off, I get lost in second acts and stuff too, you know. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Were were you a big reader? Yeah, I was um, as a kid. I I wasn't really ever introverted, but I was definitely nerdy, and um, I was – picked on um, a bit in school uh, just because I liked fantasy a lot. And I would sit around drawing fantasy maps. I, I read The Hobbit when I was nine and was absolutely in love with Tolkien. Um, and yeah, I, I read a lot as a kid. I, it was a cool way to escape. I, I didn't really like school a whole ton. I was either bored or disliking like math, let's say. Uh, so I would just escape to books. I love it. I love it. What were some of the, you, you mentioned Tolkien. Um, what was it about fantasy? Was it just the escape? Was it the, the thought of a new world? Uh, what was it about those kinds of stories and characters that really grabbed your imagination? Um, I'm sure it was an escapist thing. Um, and I really liked the world building. I liked the idea of creating a language. My best friend and I would create languages, you know, because Tolkien was was known for that. He had developed, you know, um, a number of different languages in his world. Uh, the maps, I was also visual. I did a lot of visual art. I drew a lot as a kid. So uh, the maps and that element really spoke to me. So I would do that. Um, I would make maps for the stories and worlds I was building. Uh, and I liked um, the idea of uh, a journey. It's a, a lot of fantasy starts with, you know, the most Um, unexpected hero or somebody who doesn't believe they can do something. And then they set off on a uh, quest to, to, uh, you know, acquire something and it leads them on a path of growth. And I thought, I think that really spoke to me a lot as a kid. Gotcha. 
You you mentioned uh, all the writing that you did, and you, and you and your friends had you know set set up this whole publishing venture. Did did you ever have a teacher or a parent that uh, that recognized this in you and and offered encouragement? Yeah, I did. So in second grade, it would be uh, Miss D'Angelo, and she saw us writing these books, and with our little publishing company, we had thought we had created. And she let me kind of skip out on math a lot <laughs> in the end to do it. And uh, she really encouraged us to do uh, to create stories and allowed us to kind of break away from projects. If we wanted to write a book about something or write a book in place of another project, she let us do that because we kind of went all out. And she kind of um, the last day of school, I remember um, I was seven and she, I was leaving that school for another one. I had moved across the city and she, you know, just encouraged me to keep writing. And she essentially told me to kind of never give up and to dedicate my first novel to her. So that really stuck with me uh, because it was so important to me back then. Did uh, At what point um, did you decide that this was something you were going to pursue um, career wise, uh, did, was this something that you, that you, uh, went to college for? At, at what point did you realize this was a path you were gonna, you were gonna stay on and pursue? Um, well, when I reached my teens, uh, my friends and I, we started making films. Uh, cameras were improving. Uh, you could, it was mini DV then, so it wasn't like iPhones. Not everybody had a camera, but you could buy a, somewhat decent mini DV camcorder type thing and you could shoot and we wanted to make films we wanted to tell stories through that medium uh, as well and so I kept writing and I got into screenwriting and I went to school for screenwriting and directing and uh, pursued that and then later went to a few professional development programs uh, that are kind of prominent here in Toronto that's where I'm based up in Canada and uh, I kind of, I think when I started making films, I really liked the aspect of building and performing and the visual aspect there because it combined the visual, my visual arts brain with my writing brain. And so I think that at that point, I wanted to pursue it as a career, but I also the entire time wanted to write in prose, to write novels and, and short stories and whatnot. And I didn't, I always did that as well, but film sort of dominated for a while. What have you found are are some of the the big differences in writing for film as opposed to writing prose? Well, the format for screenplays uh, is pretty restrictive, and you have a very narrow window to get in and get out and describe everything, and not everything you want to come across in a scene or a part of the story is on the page. You know, a lot of there's a lot of collaboration, and so you suggest a lot of things, and you learn to be a little more, it's almost like poetry, you learn to pick certain words and use certain imagery to try to evoke what you would like out of a scene as opposed to spelling everything out. So that's hugely different from, from writing in prose, because writing in prose involves more detail, and you can be a little more malleable with the actual format. You don't have to, you know, write a, only a page a three page scene, you know, and that's all you have. And it, it, you can kind of like run a little bit with prose. Um, and uh, yeah, I think in screenwriting, you just focus more on action and progressing the plot through action because the final product involves actors and that's their primary focus when they, uh, they get up there to perform your work. Well, you've also written comics. Uh, is, is comics kind of a hybrid between screenwriting and and prose writing, or do you approach it as a completely different thing? Um, because I came from sort of film and TV, I have that brain. And I, when I started writing comics, I definitely saw it as a hybrid. I had the ability to somewhat get into the psychology of a character and hear and do like an internal like um, monologue for them. And like I had dialogue that I could put in that I couldn't really have in film because, you know, having constant voiceovers and narration is not always so great in film and TV. So in, but in comic books, it's a little bit different. You can play with that a little bit more, but as I was, you know, learning the medium and working in it, I 
So I, it's heavily, to me, it's heavily about editing. It felt like film editing a bit because as I wrote, uh, I was very mindful of every panel because panels are a precious commodity in, in writing comics and graphic novels. You have limited page count usually if you're with a publisher and you're not doing your own independent project. You know, I would have 20, 20 to 24 pages per book. And I had to really think about each page turn where the spine was, you know, if I was, you know, where the eye traveled. So it really to me was like filmmaking because you were trying to lead the eye and then psychologically lead the reader with edits through page turns. So definitely, yeah, a hybrid. My long-winded answer is yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that was a perfect answer. Um, the Some of the comics that you've done uh, are the Orphan Black uh, comics for IDW and the new project. Uh, that you're here to talk about is uh, is also an Orphan Black project. It's called The Next Chapter, and it's with Serial Box. Um, for folks who may not be familiar with Orphan Black, can you give us kind of the 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 fifty thousand uh, you know feet view of what Orphan Black is? Mm. So Orphan Black is a sci-fi show that's set uh, in the real world. It's set in Toronto, Canada, and it revolves around a group of women who discover that they are in fact human clones. They had been cloned in 1984 and that uh, they, through the journey of uh, becoming self-aware as clones, they learn that their genetic, uh, their genetic, their gene, genome, sorry, their genome essentially uh, is uh, intellectual property belonging to a corporation. So it's about them battling with that and coming to terms with the fact that they are not like everybody else on the planet and that they're actually considered a commodity. They're fought over by different uh, groups of people and studied and there's fanaticism around them as well. So it's it's a twist and turn uh, sci-fi suspense thriller. And uh, there there have been like five seasons uh, of that show. Is that right? Yeah, there have been five seasons, so they've covered a lot of ground, and they uh, they do a very good job of focusing on on the science and the ethics of it, and what it means emotionally for these women too. So it's really fascinating. It's not just about you know the um, the technological aspect of cloning; it delves a lot into the psychology and emotional journey of it. Gotcha. Well, as a as a, a geek yourself, um, this had to be kind of a, a uh, an ideal project to to get to work with. Uh, what were your feelings uh, about first getting to to work with this property? Uh, it was pretty exciting. Uh, I'm not going to lie, and it, it was a show that was created and shot in my hometown of Toronto. So I was pretty proud of a lot of the people involved, and the universe is so. Uh, interesting and the characters are so diverse and well-rounded it was extremely fun to play with that sort of aspect of uh, Orphan Black so I was I was pretty pumped to be writing for them yeah. so so how did you get involved uh, and and which came first this uh, project was Serial Box or the comics uh, the comics came first I started the comics in 2015 I've done uh uh, three series uh, for Orphan Black through IDW Publishing. And um, I got involved because um, many of the people, it's it's a really small film and TV community up in Toronto. Uh, and I knew a number of the people on the show. And um, I caught wind of this uh, opening for a uh, uh, comic book writer for them. And uh, like it just threw word of mouth. And I had met the the editor on the project at IDW uh, the previous year. And I just threw my work in and he read it and I got hired essentially. Oh, that's so cool. Um, so, so tell us about this, this new project, the uh, Orphan Black, the next chapter. Um, well, first off, what is Serial Box and, and how, how is this different um, in, in what's going on? with how they deliver stories and uh, and and kind of walk us through how Orphan Black works into this. Um, so Serial Box is a subscription-based uh, service where they provide serialized stories. It's almost like subscribing to a season of TV. We've written 10 episodes for uh, Orphan Black, uh, the next chapter, 
And essentially one episode will come out every week, just like an episode of television. And it's uh, give or take an hour in length, either to read or to listen to the audiobook version, which is read by Tatiana Maslany, who's on the show. Um, and uh, yeah, we take you through a 10-part uh, journey in the Orphan Black Universe for, through uh, Serial Box. That's awesome. And a new, uh, a new chapter comes out each week? Each week, yeah. Gotcha. So what can you tell us about this story? And does, does the next chapter, how does it fit in or dovetail with the, with the five seasons of, of TV? Well, um, we pick up eight years after the end of this series. So we are not only following clones that everybody will recognize have if they've watched the show, uh, we're also introducing new clones uh, who come into their lives and we're kind of picking up where uh, where the show left off and we're jumping ahead and explaining, we're kind of touching on what's become um, of this group of women known as the Clone Club. The Orphan Black, um, this continuation of Orphan Black uh, is a story that follows not only the clones that we've seen on the TV series, um, but a few new clones as well. It's set eight years in the future from the end of the show. And we pick up with Cosima and some of the other clones and we show what's happened to them uh, in that time uh, after they kind of put Dyad and Neil Lucian behind them. And uh, we, we tell their story while kind of amping it up again. And uh, it's hard to explain because I can't reveal too much, but we, uh, we throw them into another little bit of turmoil because uh, just when they thought that they, they could go back to uh, living peaceful lives, uh, they discover that that's not necessarily the case. Well, this is a really unique way to, to continue telling a story that, uh, you know, with this TV show that's very popular and you get a certain run, you know, all TV shows come to an end at some point, uh, and there are always, you know, fans who want more. Uh, and this, this seems like a really great way to, um, to continue those stories. You've got this, this giant world, it's our world, but you've got, um, you know, the, the circumstances that, that, really lend themselves to to just story that could just keep going on and on how do you um how do you decide uh where the next story goes um that's kind of that's a hard question to answer um the next story so this story uh itself was pitched by our showrunner malka older a really talented sci-fi writer uh so she came in with a uh, a concept uh, that was some, pretty formed, and uh, she had an idea of how to take the Orphan Black universe and take its characters and throw them into a uh, a new sort of, I want to say it's like a, a new philosophical approach to the idea of cloning and what it could mean for the world uh, in a different context. So she came in with that. And then when we brought in other writers into a writing room, because the way Serial Box works is they have uh, various writers come in and write certain episodes. Uh, so kind of like a TV writing room. Uh, everybody started to bring in different ideas based on her initial concept. And we built off of that. And it was a little bit challenging because we're following five seasons of television. A lot has happened. Uh, and Orphan Black is a fast paced show. Many, many things happen in one episode. So we were trying not to tread the same ground. So we were really mindful of what the characters have already gone through, what the show has already explored. And we tried to veer into different territory and, and kind of expand the scope of human cloning and telling a story about that on a more, um, on a more international level, actually. I think I can say that. I think I can kind of get away with that a little bit. Yeah. Um, I don't think I revealed too much. <laughs> well, it sounds like, you know, when we were talking about comics and the, the sort of hybrid storytelling aspect, it's, it's, it's prose, but not just prose, and it's, it's visual, but not just visual. Um, it sounds like you guys are taking a similar approach in writing uh, the Serial Box uh, episodes. 
Um, yeah, yeah, we are. It's it. There, there's definitely a lot of uh, it, there's a there's a plot that moves and has suspense and and mo thriller moments. But we also um, we pay attention to keeping it visual, and we get to de delve into the psychology of characters. So I think where we differ a little bit more from the show and the comics is that we get to get into people's minds and because the characters are so unique and so fleshed out from the show it's it's really interesting to be able to do that because we can you know create chains of thought and go down different internal rabbit holes with these characters um so yeah we're trying to keep we're trying to keep true to the tone of the show while expanding and becoming a little bit more intimate with each character well, when you're when you're writing for for this medium, uh, because it is prose, and with Serial Box you can read it or you can listen to the audio, um, but it, it would seem like you're going into this knowing this is going to be performed by someone, not just available, uh, you know, as as a book uh, to be read as prose, but it, it's going to be acted as well. Does that go into some of the decisions that you make in the writing? For me personally, yeah. I mean, I come from a screenwriting background. I, I do a lot of screenwriting still. I write video games right now, which involves a lot of scenes. And I, um, I, I take a lot of my focus and I do pour it into how much dialogue am I putting into a scene? Am I putting too much dialogue? Should I dial it back? And also, am I throwing enough in there that it doesn't have enough color in terms of performance when Pat reads it? Is there enough for her to chew on? Uh, so I think about that a lot. I think I'm kind of trained now to do that. My brain kind of just gravitates towards that aspect. Um, but definitely, I think knowing that you have an actor coming in to perform, it, it changes the way one writes, for sure. When when someone uh, signs up with their cereal box um, uh, subscription, uh, do, do you subscribe to one show? Uh, what what is that? What does the subscription get you? Um, now I, I'm not too well versed on all of the ins and outs of it, um, but you can go in and you can subscribe exclusively to Orphan Black, from what I understand. I don't know how it works. If you you can probably get a different type of subscription, but the current subscri subscription for Orphan Black is nine ninety nine for the season. Uh, currently, before our launch date on September twelfth. Gotcha, and uh, and there are lots of other series on there, uh, lots of geeky stuff and and genre fiction, uh, something there for everybody. Um, when uh, Helly, when people finish this season, um, do you, what do you hope uh, that they get out of this new season of Orphan Black in this new delivery mechanism? Uh, are, are, are do you in writing this and planning out this season, um, were there specific hopes and goals that you have for, for readers and listeners? Yeah. Um, I think for me, what I like most about the TV series is this kind of, they use the word rabbit hole a lot in it. And it's, I, I like that idea of going down the rabbit hole, uh, going on a kind of a dark journey, but an intimate journey, journey with these women where you feel like you get to know them really well and you empathize with them and you're confronted with the most bizarre people and situations. I mean, like the show put a man with a, a tail on it. He had been genetically modified to have a tail. So, I mean, I hope that we can deliver some of that kind of tone and that we can uh, get, get the uh, online clone club excited about uh, this continuation of the series and that they feel like they've gone on a trip again and that it's a good trip, um, and that we presented another series of issues, ethical issues, and, you know, personal, emotional issues when it comes to living as a clone in the world. Uh, I think that the topic of cloning overall is, is has been controversial, and it's, uh, it's, you know, as we learn more and more about genetics, it's, pretty relevant it's it's scary we have a lot of stuff in the show that touches on other aspects of uh technology and science that are you know coming to light in the real world um 
particularly some of it's about security, um, uh, about international relations. I think that I want people to come away feeling like they've enjoyed the trip, but they also, <laughs> I don't want to say we want to scare them or anything, but, you know, we want people to feel like they've, they've seen a bit of, you know, what's out in the real world in our story and that it's, uh, we're, we're exploring things and, and bringing things up for topics of conversation as topics of conversation for everybody um yeah i think that's kind of get people talking while enjoying uh following these women well orphan black the next chapter so much fun uh when people are hearing this i think the second episode will just be dropping um people can go sign up for it at serialbox.com slash orphan dash black and that's s-e-r-i-a-l B-O-X. Uh, Helly, we know that you're under some strict di- uh, deadlines and need to get back to work. Uh, thank you so much for taking time to come on the show and talk about Orphan Black. Thank you so much for having me on. Stay tuned now for an audiobook excerpt from Richard Glebe's The Jason Crane Series. You took a terrible risk tonight. Why? You don't know? The first rule! I was told by a friend that I shouldn't reveal my gift to anyone who doesn't have a gift themselves. That's exactly right. Because everyone we tell dies. Yes. You might have marked me for death. Made you a target for a ghost. Why can't people know what we can do? What makes it so dangerous? Valerie took up the fireplace prongs and stabbed the logs. It's called the Great Curse. Sparks exploded from glowing crevices and drizzled upwards, ricocheting off the black belly of the cauldron, turning into tiny ashes that disappeared up the chimney. It was cast by a powerful witch over three hundred years ago. Witch? Sorry, but witch? Please, there's no such thing. Valerie closed her eyes. A spoon leapt from Jason's dish and caught him in the temple. He wiped melted ice cream from his cheek. You were saying? She cast the curse to stop the witch trials. In Salem? Jason searched his memory. 1690... 1692. They burned her alive. In the Salem Common, the only witch to be burned. The cauldron smoked slightly. Its contents had evaporated. A sharp, charred scent filled the room. Wait, said Jason. There were no witches. They were just, I don't know, victims of religious hysteria, right? So you're saying the witch trials were justified? Justified? So if a witch did exist... It would be okay to kill her. No, I just thought... You're right, never mind. There was one witch in Salem, at least. A woman with a powerful gift. She only wanted to protect people like us. To give the gifted their anonymity, refuge. She cast the great curse. As she burned, she proclaimed that mortals who know a witch shall know death. And that is the great curse. And it's still in effect after all this time. Mortal, as in non-gifted. No mortal can know about you, about any authentic witch. Jason winced. Isn't there another word besides that? She shrugged. So no one can know what I am, what I can do, or else they become a target. Right. The spirit world will obey the great curse and try to kill them. The spirit world. The other realm. Jason rubbed his eyes. How much of this was reality and how much of this was Valerie's nutty brand of mysticism? He felt himself pulling back, as usual, for fear of contagion. He'd spent his whole life reading science fiction, 
He hated paranormal tales. This was... this was... not his genre. <laughs>